if you're a parent, if you're a loved one, if you're a spouse, it is not a shared battle. This is not your battle. This is not your fault. This is not your mess to clean up. This is not a burden for you to carry. This is a personal journey that the addict must go through and decide on their own accord when they are finished, when they have had enough pain and when they are ready to change their lives. Whatever you do couldn't have been done better. Whatever you've done couldn't have been done better. So what advice do I have to someone who has either lost someone or continues to battle with someone every day? Keep going. Keep doing whatever it is you're doing that is keeping that addict alive because that is the best you could possibly do. That's it. That's all I have. I can't, there's nothing else I could say. There's no other piece of advice I could give because of how challenging that scenario is besides keep going and don't let the fucking light go out. I'm Doug Bobst, personal trainer, best-selling author, and entrepreneur, and I'm on a mission to help others become the best version of themselves. So I'd like to welcome you to the Adversity Advantage Podcast, where we will help you use obstacles, failures, and setbacks to give you that edge needed for success. I'll be interviewing people from all walks of life on how they overcame trials and turned them into triumphs. So please, sit back, relax, and get ready to be absolutely blown away by some of the wisdom and stories you're about to hear. Mike Malak, welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here, man. Happy to be here. I know. I feel like we're kindred spirits. I was telling you before we recorded, I feel like our stories are very similar in so many ways, except I went to jail and got caught and you got arrested and kind of just kept going. And I know for you, you've alluded to the fact that you had like many rock bottom moments. I don't know if it was driving your car off a cliff, getting busted multiple times with drugs, smoking crack when you were trying, you're supposed to be caring for your sick grandpa or whether it was friends dying. But I think like one of the, the main rock bottom moments where your life completely changed was, was June 18th, 2010, where an unsung hero kind of gave you this choice where, you know, essentially you could have gone to jail and, and for the five years you were backing up, but this person decided to give you, give you a shot. And before we get into that, cause I do want to know why you didn't roll the dice and pick the other option. How did you get to that place where you're selling copious amounts of heroin, you're massively addicted to drugs, you're 300 pounds, your life's a mess, you're completely broken in every single way? <clears throat> I mean, people always, people always look at, uh, at, at people that are in bad places in life like they just ended up there. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, oh my God, like this homeless person, you know, or, or, or this person who's addicted to drugs, like they, they, they just... You know, it was like it, it happened last night. It all is just a a, a, um, a uh, avalanche of not avalanche, but it's like a it's like a a rolling snowball of shit. You know, and yeah. and I started I started just like a lot of other people smoking weed. You know, when I was 15, 16 years old, and you know, moved into selling weed to support that habit, and. Um, you know, I mean, I, you, you, you read the book, so you know how kind of I ended up um, moving into narcotics. But, but when, I was, when I was 16 years old, I had a really bad uh, injury in Vermont. I broke my femur skiing. And that was the first time I was ever given a Oxycontin. And, you said your foot was like next to your head, right, or something? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I broke my femur in half, the biggest, the biggest bone in, in, in your body. Um, broke, my, broke my leg in half. My foot was right here. I woke up blood, uh, surrounded by blood on, on uh, the icy slopes of Killington Mountain for anybody that's from the East Coast. Uh, one, of the, one of the iciest places on the earth. There's no powder. It's just like skiing on concrete, basically. And um, when I was at University of Vermont, they gave me my first ever uh, OxyContin. And it was a, a 40 milligram. Uh, we used to call them peaches back in the day, right? Yeah. And um, uh, that was kind of what gave me my first taste of what it was like to not care about anything. And to be able to feel a dopamine rush that was so strong that it could overtake any kind of uh, depression or anxiety or traumatic experience that I, that I generally had been used to feeling, right? And uh, it was a taste. And I was so young that I obviously didn't see them again uh, for quite some time after that. But then when I was 17 years old, um, this was, by the way, just to give some context, in uh, 2000, it, it, the early 2000s, so call it 2002 maybe, um, during a time which I would call 
you know, the beginning of the epidemic, you know, the, the, the true uh, start of what would be a, uh, one of the worst epidemics in the history of the country that has taken hundreds of thousands of lives um, and has evolved into a, a, a catastrophe, an absolute, an absolute, you know, human rights issue, right? H human issue. Um, and in, in, in early, in 2002, Oxycontin took over um, a lot of states like mine in Connecticut, like a, like a tidal wave. Um, and by the time I graduated high school, I would say a, 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 a pretty decent majority of my, um, Sorry, a pretty decent percentage of my graduating class in Milford, Connecticut, was addicted to uh, was addicted to oxycontin, and so that was kind of what got me started on that on that train. And uh, once that started, it was there. There was no slowing down. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think you kind of had you had your hand in two different buckets of the the addiction cycle, if you will. Like, there's a lot of people that get prescribed painkillers and they become addicted, and then there's a lot of people like this is for for me where I had so much pain and trauma, insecurities, anxiety, and fear that I just got a taste of a painkiller. And I was like, wow, I don't have to feel these feelings anymore. I don't have to have these fears. I feel this monkey come off my back. I can finally be myself. And I feel like you had, you had both. You had the surgery, but I feel like you had some, some pain early on. I know you, you were trying to fit in. I know your parents got divorced. You changed schools, which was really hard for you. You went to a private school and then you all of a sudden go to this public school. It's a little bit rowdier. There was a lot more trouble there. So talk about, about that experience for you, like what you were feeling. What did the divorce kind of indirectly give you anxiety? Did you have this, this sense of what's wrong with me? Like, why is this happening to me at that time? Yeah, I think a, a mixture of that. I think uh, in, in my situation, the divorce, the divorce happened at a time <clears throat> and I'm, you know, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this, but the divorce happened at a time when I needed a uh, structure and discipline the most. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, that, that time right around a 15 year old boy's life when he really needs his dad to be there and say, yo, like, this is not what you're supposed to be fucking doing. And by the right. way, not even that, not what you're not supposed to be doing. You're not fucking doing this in my right. house. You will not do this in my house. And, uh, when my parents split, uh, and he, he was, um, he was still in the picture, but he wasn't, he wasn't intimately in the picture. He wasn't there every day and every night. Right. Um, and so I think that that was a, a, a trauma that, you know, the divorce, when I look back at my story, I generally don't even, I don't even mention the divorce because whereas other people would look at the, the their parents splitting as this massive, obstacle in their life and something that uh, a trauma that they still have to deal with for me i mean shit when i lo look at my list going back the divorce was uh you know at least i had believed it to be for a long time a cakewalk comparatively to the other things that i've fucking dealt with and seen right uh, but i think it was definitely a stepping stone like i think originally at that moment in your life i mean again i'm, I'm not you but i just look i'm just putting myself in your shoes i'm sure if you were to look at something and say okay like what was the pain what was the anxiety what was the fear coming from and a lot of it, I'm sure at that time, like you needed a role model, like you said, you needed structure. And I felt like because you didn't have that at home, you found it in other places. That's why you sold drugs to control a situation, to have some sense of structure, power, a, a community of people that you could lean on and count on. Yeah. And I mean, I also think that um, it, it, the, the, the link between mental health and uh, mental illness and, and substance abuse for, for us, yeah. you know that have been through it we we know that link very well but it's a, it's still a very heavily discounted scenario that link is just so tight and and, yeah. and also also from a propensity to um to become addicted i i mean i, I think genetic uh, the addi addiction and how it works genetically is something that people downplay and i do have a history in my family and so i kind of i kind of got a, a all of the all of the necessary you know buckets filled and so by the time i um was reintroduced to Oxycontin recreationally during this absolute uh, tidal wave of, of Purdue Pharma driven Oxycontin, which was one of the most corrupt marketing uh, situations that has ever touched this country, billions of dollars in revenue. Um, it, was, it was off to the races for me and there was no way to slow it down. Yeah, I 100% agree with you because I do, and I've heard you say this, it's like, you know, I think there is some sense of choice when it comes to 
addictions in the sense that you have to sometimes you have to make that choice to stop at some point. Like you're not going to stop using drugs unless you make a choice. But I think there's also the conversation needs to be had that there's a lot of it that's out of the out of our control. Different situations, different traumas, our environment sometimes can contribute to it, and we don't even know it. You know, it's almost happens on a subconscious level. And I think with with Purdue and the oxys, like I'm right there with you. Like I remember when I took my first painkiller. I mean, I knew I wasn't putting spinach in my system, but I had no idea that they were going to be that addictive and not just that addictive, Mike, but that fast. I mean, you know how it is. You start with five milligrams and it's all 10, 20, and then two weeks later, you're doing a couple hundred milligrams a day. Yep. And yeah. it's, well, yeah. I don't think, uh, I don't think any of us are ready for it. I, I, I talk about oxys in, in a weird way. When, when, um, when our parents were coming up, they came up on Quaaludes, they yeah. came up on Vicodin, Percocet, five milligrams here, five milligrams there. And then they, they want to look back and say, how, how the fuck did you end up going from pills to heroin, right? Yeah. And what, what they don't, what, what they're missing, what people don't understand about OxyContin is it, the, the one thing more than anything else that it was, was the bridge. Yeah. The bridge from recreational drugs to hardcore addictive uh, substances, right? And so because of how much power and narcotics you were able to pack into each one of those pills. Yeah. And, and you know, we talked about this for a minute prior to the call, but like nowadays everybody, you know, uh, uh, that, that does those kind of pills, they talk about perk 30s. Oh, I get perk 30s, rock, Roxy's, rock sets, whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm gone off the perks. The rappers are all talking about all the new age rappers. We looked at perk 30s in the early 2000s as a constellation gift. Like, I don't want yeah. your, I don't want blueberries. I don't want your perk 30s. When we, uh, Oxy 80s were the strongest pills ever besides the 160s, which were on the market for probably a year and everyone died and then they took them off because originally there was a 160 milligram oxycontin pill yeah i don't i don't re i don't remember I, I don't they were like uh something people talked about like i never saw them i'd only heard yeah. of them it was right. yeah like you said back when i was doing it it was oc80 was like the holy grail there was these red 60s that kind of came out a little bit later yeah then yeah. there was the orange 40 milligrams there was the pink 20s and then the white 10s yep. and then there was like the generic stuff which we wouldn't want because it was, want filled, it. it was filled with filler and you couldn't snort it. Correct. I mean, if you snorted it, you would end up with like with almost like this oozing coming out of your nose from all the acetaminophen or whatever. Yeah. And, and I was like you, like I, I was so, I was almost like a snob when it came to painkillers. That's all I wanted was, was 80 milligram oxys and I would do anything to get them. You know, I would burn people. I would manipulate people. I would lie. I mean, that was like my, my full-time job as you know, as we all know, is how am I going to score? Who am I going to do it with? What do I have to sell to get the money? Where am I going to do it? What am I going to eat afterwards? What songs am I going to play when I'm literally... Isn't it ridiculous? Isn't it yeah. ridiculous that, that <laughs> people, people will nev never understand how addiction is... It's, it's a religion of sorts. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, dude, can you imagine... Why would I ever say, can you imagine? Of course you can, but like to the average person, can yeah, you yeah. imagine the idea of being fully invested in just one thing? That is it. There is nothing else on the entire planet that fucking matters besides this one thing. It's mind blowing. And people aren't able to comprehend what that looks like when you try to explain it to people that your entire goal in life is to get high, is how am I going to cover myself for tomorrow when I wake up in the morning? I don't want to be sick tomorrow. What can I do? And so, so I think I, I in, in a way, fortunately, didn't have to go through a lot of the robbery shit, a lot of the burning shit, because I was a dealer. And so I put yeah. all my effort into dealing. And that was, and it, and it wasn't, and, and like I said earlier, like, I've always been entrepreneurial. I've always been very good at building rapport. I've always been very good at branding. When I first started selling weed, I was I was the guy that had the stuff that had names. Oh, we got this shit from BC. This is the Jack Hare. This is the OG, whatever, right? I was always good at that, right? How can I package what's what pricing is moving best? Oh, if I do an eighth today, will they, you know, will they come back for a quarter next week if I make it three six instead of three four? Like I was a, a brain when it came to selling drugs. 
And so when it came to, when it came time to switch from marijuana nar to narcotics, it was the same, it was the same thing. And uh, I remember, you know, we were, we were working with these people who were writing fake scripts. Yeah. And you know, obviously how big the fake scripts were back in the day. And we had yeah. this one guy who was just getting thousands and thousands of fucking pills from, from writing, getting, you know, he would just buy prescription pads off of doctors and he would just write fake scripts. He, the, the doctor would just sign all of them. He ended up getting, he ended up getting uh, arrested by the DA. Um, but, but I mean, that was how I, those were the two things I did. What were, were pick up, sell all day, do drugs, count money, and then do it again. That was it. It was just the same thing every single day. Monotony. And you, well, yeah. And you were spending, you know, hundreds of dollars a day. Cause that was the one thing people I'm sure asked you, they would ask me and others as like, wow, I bet you're saving tons of money. No, you're, you're breaking like the first code of the 10 crack commandments and you're getting high on your own supply. Everybody knows that line. It's a pretty famous line, right? And that you're pretty much just selling to support your habit. Like you talk, we talk about like you do whatever it takes literally to get high and support your habit. And that was something in, in my experience, like I was selling a ton of pot, could have easily been putting away a ton of money, but all of my profit went up my nose and I got involved in selling pills, very similar to your story where you'd sell enough pills to make a, a few bucks and then get high for free. And it was just, it was a nightmare. I mean, my, my addiction got so bad that I was, lift, I was missing essentially like half my left nostril and didn't have a bowel movement for, for a month. And well, you remember the first pages of my book, you know, yeah. by the way, yeah. the book we keep, it's called the fifth vital. I know I'm sure you're, you'll mention yeah. that, but yeah. we keep, I, we keep referencing it, but I mean, our overlap is crazy. Cause I still, you know, have problems with my nose because of the damage I did to it through both sniffing and also digging at it with a razor blade, you know? Yeah. So, um, it, it's, a, it's, a the only way to explain it to someone would be war. And I hate to, I hate to um, discount the rightful nature of actual conflict and more so the heroic, um, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, output and service of the people that go to war for this country or for any country, but it's a battle. It's a fucking battle day in and day out that, that deals with, uh, uh, factors that that are are incomprehensible and, yeah. and mind blowing, you know, and 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 honestly, like that was what kind of th those those factors and those stories and those tales are what drove the book to where it ended up going. And right. and and I originally, um, when when we when we started talking about publishing the book, and I'd written for about seven years from about 2013 all the way through to about 2020, a little bit at a time. When we first started talking about publishing it and I, I, I self published it, but with like a boutique publishing agency, they said, there's a lot of shit in this book, man. Like there's, there's some really, really nasty stuff in this book. Like, 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 are you sure? Like you're an internet personality. Now you've got millions of followers. Um, you're on the, one of the biggest podcasts in, in, in the world. Um, this shit's disgusting. Man. <laughs> like, like, are you positive that you want this stuff to go out? And I thought about it for a long time. And, and um, I ended up coming that coming to this, to this kind of uh, undisputable truth, which is that if you cannot create rapport and relatability with the, with the addict out there or the mental illness sufferer out there or the person struggling out there, you cannot then give them the hope for them to get out of it. And so a lot of those stories that like I personally was very embarrassed of and very worried about were the stories that created the bond between me and the reader that eventually allowed me to give them something that made them stop doing drugs, stop cutting themselves, stop having uh, panic attacks over the fact that their mother died of a heroin over like dude like the the, the the feedback that I've gotten and the amount of people I've talked to uh, honestly gives me goosebumps it, 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 it is it I, I it is the one thing where I could say I've finally been able to give back in a meaningful way and to to, to start to right the wrongs that I've fucking done on this planet.
Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you're so lucky to be alive. Um, for sure. I mean, gosh, the amount of times you escape death, it's mind blowing in your book. I definitely encourage people to go pick up Mike's book. I mean, he gets into the nitty gritty of a lot of these stories that I think you're going to, you're going to get a lot of questions that you've had answered because I think a lot of people, they wonder, Mike, they're like, how does somebody go from growing up in like a decent family? They go to school. Um, then they, you know, they're just starting to smoke weed. How do they end up doing heroin? Like what happens in between? And I think most people that are dealing with opiate addiction now, they're not the people that are just experimenting with painkillers and then stop. You're hearing about people now that are just hooked on heroin. They're hooked on fentanyl. They're doing whatever they, they can to get that into their, into their system. So like what, what caused you, I know what caused it, but if you could give the listeners just a summary of what, what was it that caused you to make that switch from painkillers to, to heroin? In, I think it was like 2004 or five Purdue pharma realized we are fucked. We are in deep, deep, deep. Tr they knew before that they right. knew before that they, you, I mean, for, for people who are knowledgeable about the Purdue situation, once again, uh, the Sackler family, one of the most, uh, corrupt, cover-ups and disgusting um, uh, marketing and business operations that have ever existed in this country. Billions and billions and billions of dollars off of, off of uh, the pain of people who were promised a way out of pain and were introduced a pain that they never could have fucking understood or saw coming. In the early 2000s, Purdue realized we're in a lot of trouble here. We have created a actual opiate epidemic in this country. It is, it is happening in real time and there is nothing we can do to stop it. Out of control. They, they were already federally in trouble. And one of, the thing, one of the first things they did was started to remove Oxycontin from the markets and, and from the shelves of pharmacies. And so you saw this mass pullback on supply of Oxycontin to the country. And at a time, at a time when, at that time, we were used to getting Ziploc bags. I mean, I would go to a pharmacy in Bridgeport, Connecticut and get Ziploc bags of Oxy 80s. We would get them a thousand at a time and we would owe $30,000 to the whatever, right? We would make 60,000, but the profit, you know where it went, right? Um, when they pulled back on the Oxys, then they tried to come out with a crush-proof oxy, which that wouldn't work, right? The, the, the supply of everything was dwindling. And one day I, I called my friend um, and I said to him, hey, man, uh, I can't find anything. The town's dry. I'm sick. The girlfriend's sick. My customers are all sick. We're, this is bad. So Very you mean bad. sick going through withdrawal, right? Withdrawal. Yeah. Sweating. Shitting, vomiting, shaking, throwing up on themselves, sick, oh, yeah. right? You know the story. Yeah. And uh, he said, yeah, man, I know. Um, but uh, I just got a little bit of D, uh, of D from Bridgeport. And I was like, what is he talking about right now? Like, what are you talking about? He's like, I got D, dude, from Bridgeport. And I was like, dude, what are you talking about? What does that even mean? Is that like a, a new pill or something? He was like, no, like dope, dude, like heroin. And like, it was like a, it was like, I remember the phone call very well. It was, it was a very, um, a very memorable moment in my journey um, because I, I said to him, to myself, just mentally, I said, did he just say heroin? Is that what just ha Is that where we've gone? And um, slowly but surely after that point, it, it, it became a mainstay and it became a part of our lives. And, and. Uh, I speak about it in the book a little bit too. The drug that the life of an addict is a life of desperation. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a life of, of decision-making. It's not a life of saying, Oh, this is a journey or a, a place I don't want to go. It's a life of how do I make the pain stop? If you have a way to make this pain stop, I will take it and I don't care what it is. Right. And so there was a little bit of um, hesitation 
but uh, slowly but surely, pretty much everyone eventually ended up doing heroin. Yeah, and that's generally the story, right? Where people, they can't either afford the street value of pills because I think it's supply and demand. So if the supply is low, then the demand's high, the price goes up. Like I think now uh, I happen to ask some people um, that I had worked with or that I was that I knew that were just early in recovery and I just was talking to them. I just said, hey, like, how much is it? Because we're just talking about how they got addicted to stuff. And they said, same story. They got into painkillers. I said, well, how much is painkillers? And they were like, it's like almost like one to $2 a milligram. So yeah, yeah. back in the day when, when Mike and I were in the thick of our addiction, like an 80 milligram pill, I think the street value, correct me if I'm wrong, was like anywhere between like 40 and 60 bucks. Yeah. yeah something, something like that. Started about 40, uh, 40, 45. Uh, as far, it, that was probably in the very beginning days. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was a mass supply. And then near near the end, when they started to reach that holy grail status, I mean, it was sixty. I mean, you had people starting to talk about sixty five. I didn't see those days. I had already moved on to uh, um, to heroin at that point. But yeah. I had heard them going to as high as a dollar milligram. People were getting eighty dollars for oxy eighties. Yeah, I, and and they became so addictive. I mean, they are. They were just so addictive to the point where I I don't even know if I've told this story publicly. I might have, but I can't remember where I was getting. Um, 80 milligram pills from a guy and he had said he's like i think these are fake he's like i don't know if they're fake he's like but if you can just have them you can buy them from me like you know penny on the dollar whatever it was like super cheap he's like and you can just have them i don't want to deal with it so i remember he gave me like i forget what it was like 1080s and i didn't know if they were real or not i licked every time release off to see if they were real and i could tell if they were fake because if they were fake they had no taste but once you got that i got i got one i remember that had this medicine medicine taste and i remember i just felt like I, I had won the lottery and really it was just me getting my fix to be able to get high and numb that pain because i think as addicts and i think this probably happened with you is at first when you start using drugs you're doing it to get high and to have fun and then eventually the pendulum swings and you're doing it to numb pain numb the shame of where your life is as a result of of the drugs yeah you're just trying to get by yeah to get by. i mean it's it's it, it's you, you talked about the the time release uh and and honestly like one of the historical and infamous tales of ox of the oxy days um the time re the removal of the time release was a was a the greatest moment of your life you know it was the greatest moment of your life you know and at, at the time and uh when we started uh it was extremely ceremonial you know, and we would all get together and we would take the time releases off and we'd sit there and we'd chop an 80 up four ways. And, you know, and, 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 and at first it started and it was a weekend thing. We would do it at parties. It's like, yo, you want to try an oxy? Like, you want to do an oxy this weekend at a party? Um, and in the end, you know, you, you, you found yourself removing, you know, the time seal and, and, and wiping it on your shirt, you know, and, and, instead of being in, in, you know, a, a living room surrounded by your friends, you'd be in a, in a dirty bathroom, you know, crushing an oxy up on the back of a toilet, uh, mm -hmm. using a, using a, a, a rolled up business card to sniff it because you had no dollars left. You didn't even have any money to sniff it with, you know? And so yeah. the, the, um, I think the, the story of an addict or the story of someone who uses drugs, um, generally follows that trajectory it starts in this very luxurious format or ceremonial format and then over the course of time devolves into um desperation and yeah. into um a, a, a filthy disgusting ravaging disaster that is all encompassing and and destroying you know and um that happens with any drug i mean i mean it happens sure. with any drug. you see it with people with cocaine even you know which which people consider to be a highly addictive substance for people like me and you who for people you know like for myself someone who smoked crack for some yeah. time i know what an actually addictive substance is you know like very and of course cocaine is is highly addictive and crack is cocaine so i'm simply saying it, it always follows that trajectory there's no yeah. one that was ever like oh well i you know i started using drugs uh in my dorm room at college, you know, and in, in a community college. And by the time I was done, I was smoking crack in a Bugatti. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, that's not the trajectory of drug use. Right. It, it, it is, it, 
you are not smarter, stronger, faster, better, or wiser than the drugs. You're just not. You don't have them figured out. You don't have a way to do them recreationally. You don't. It does, you, you know this. And we talk about this all the time, and, you know, whether it's in the program or just conversation with other addicts. Like, you're not. You're not. You're not faster. They're better than you, and they'll get you. You know, so it's um, that that story is is about as well known as 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 any in the addiction field. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's important for people because I have a lot of parents that listen to this too to to hear this. And this is why I wanted you to tell your story like this. Is like this is how it starts. It doesn't just start with someone just going out and and putting a needle in their arm or someone just doing heroin or even oxys. There's something that transpires before that. And there's these dominoes that just start to fall into place one by one, one domino, the next domino and so on and so forth. And, and I know for you, like, I think the fire like was lit a little bit when you started smoking and dealing pot, then it lit a little bit more when you were doing oxy. Then when you started doing heroin, I feel like you just took gasoline and just dumped it on the fire and it just like, Whoa, am I right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think, I think just oxy, like uh, oxygen and heroin, they could all be combined. Yeah. To be honest. I mean, just the, just opiates in general were, were my thing. And I mean, it was, I, I also was on methadone for six years, you know what I'm saying? And, and, um, that was just another layer of, of, of opiate addiction, you know? And, and, um, it's just, it's, <sighs> it's just hard to put into words how, how tight those handcuffs are and how, how it's able to just destroy the lives of such good people. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's, that's the biggest thing that I wanted to convey in my book because we'll talk a lot today about, about downfall. When ironically, my my crawl out is the is the part of the story that really touches people and really motivates, right? And 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 the downfall is was a necessary part. If I, yeah. Like I said earlier, if I didn't describe the downfall in vivid detail, the success, the followers, the money, all of that shit wouldn't matter. There's right. no problem to hear that. There's a ton of successful people on this planet. Yeah. There's ton of successful people on this planet there's not a ton of people who are willing to talk about being a one foot in the coffin after a decade addiction to heroin and crack cocaine and methadone and xanax prescription and alcohol and whatever else and then and then the trajectory back out because that's the story that i want to be taken away from it that no matter what your circumstances no matter where you are in life that not only can you get back to a baseline because that was all I ever really wanted. I used to look at these people who had a new Camry and a a, a little dog in their yard at a $150,000 house in Connecticut. And I said, if I ever get that back, I will be the most blessed person on this fucking planet, dude. Not only can you have that, not only can you have a mortgage, can you have a family, can you have all of those things that are beautiful and they're right? You can have everything. You can have everything. It doesn't matter if you're 30 right now. It doesn't matter if you're 40 right now. It doesn't matter if you're 60. If you're an addict or, or, or an alcoholic or someone suffering from mental illness, once you get healthy, it could, you can have everything. Not just some of it, but you have to start with that one thing. You have to get clean. You have to get healthy. You have to get your mind in, in, in check. And however you do that, and, and, and I talk about that a lot in the book too, and, you know, and we'll get into it, I'm sure, but just like coping mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. Tactics for success. How are you going to get mentally healthy? So I just, I just always wanted to, I just always wanted to give people hope. That's it. And, and, and that's it. Yeah. And, and you are. And I think, you know, it's interesting, like, you know, for a good part of your life, you were selling drugs to help to help people in a way you thought you were helping people. You thought you were the doctor, if you will. And now you're selling hope to help people in a way that's actually positive, healthy, conducive to improving the the, the way that people live. And you know, after heroin, it seems like you know life really started to fall apart fast for you. you went and, li- and lived with a with a dealer out where you in New Haven or Bridgeport. 
Bridgeport at the time. Bridgeport first. Yeah. Then Brid- yeah. And then you end up selling for him. He gets into some trouble with his connection, owes him a bunch of money. The guy comes in, pistol whips him, blood all over the floor. You pretty much have to stop this person from killing this guy. Meanwhile, after this, you would think that would stop things. You end up getting arrested multiple times. You should have gone to jail, really, because you were busted with uh, heroin once, right? And uh, the, uh, two, two, twice. Two, two, yeah. And then you're on, you're backing up five years, and then you got pulled over again. And then they searched you and somehow didn't find. That was the scariest moment. And, and I, I, cause like you said, there's a lot of rock bottoms. Yeah. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of like, oh shit moments. Yeah. And, and obviously, right. And I, and I mean, even greater than that monumental oh shit moments and from driving cars off cliffs, like you said, and into riverbeds and waking up to, you know, broken femurs, fractal, uh, fractured skulls, um, knives, guns, uh, shootings, a- anything you could imagine. Like all that stuff was, oh shit, obviously, but nothing. I don't, I don't, I just don't think there was anything as scary as that moment. I could still feel that fear. And I, I, I so just I'll give some context at the time I, I probably had reached just about the height of my heroin, uh, dealing days. Um, I was, I was picking up uh, rock heroin, they, they call it, they call them fingers. And so it's, a, it's, uh, 10, it's about 10 grams of rock heroin. And so basically you're picking up enough weight in heroin that it's not even powder form yet. It's coming from God knows the cartels, whatever it, you've reached it at pretty much the distribution standpoint from a distribution point and you're buying it in, in pretty heavy weights. Right. And so I would go to New Haven. This was after Bridgeport toppled. The DEA completely shut down that, that operation. Uh, my, my connected nine years uh, as a result of that DEA raid. It was a simultaneous raid with DEA, ATF. There was guns involved. It was a disaster. Um, I, was, I was picking up in New Haven uh, and I, was, I would take it back. And, you know, I, I, I had, it, I was at a point where I had like write off, like not write offs, but I had business expenses. I knew there was a hotel room that needed to be purchased just to break this shit down. And so I would, and I was by myself. I would, at this point, I was, I didn't have anyone with me. It was just me. And so I'd go into the projects in New Haven. I would drive this shit back to a hotel room and I would spend three hours um, pulse grinding with a coffee gr- uh, uh, bean grinder, this heroin into powder. Never cut it. I never cut my product. I sold it completely how I got it. And uh, I, would, I would take a straw and I would, di- I would cut the top half of the straw off and I would make this little scooper. And I knew exactly how much would be the right amount per bag. And I would just sit there and bag up, bag up, bag up, bag up heroin for hours. And I would listen to music, do a line, you know, do a, another line, do a couple more lines, right? And just sit there and get fucked up and bag up by myself. So one day I, was, I, I had just finished up at the hotel. And I was on, uh, at the time, I was already a, a um, convicted felon. I had a five-year suspended sentence uh, that I that was, maybe I was down to like four years at that. Well, I, I guess it hangs over. So I had a five-year suspended sentence. I had maybe four years left of probation. And um, I was, I had gotten into my car. I, I had a Jeep at the time. And I was driving the product from New Haven to Milford, Bridgeport, where I was going to start unloading it, right? And I had dozens of people waiting for it. Um, and I had about 300, I would say about 360 bags of heroin on me. So about 36 bundles, completely wrapped up, stamped everything. Right. And I was driving, uh, through East Haven, um, suspended license, the whole nine, you know, completely dirty. And I get pulled over by the cops and, they come up to the window and they go, uh, Mike, what's going on? It, and that's how it was in a lot of cities. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, like license and registration it was, Hey Mike, what's, what are you, what are you up to today? You know? And I was like, Oh, I just left my, uh, my, my girlfriend's house. You know, I'm just driving back to my, to my grandma's cause I was living with my girl, like staying or seeing my grandma a lot, staying with my grandma at the time. Uh, and they were like, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, why don't you give us a license and registration? We'll just check everything out. You know? All right, sure. Here you go. Here's license registration. I, at that point, I'm like, dude, it's over. Mm. It's over. It's been a fantastic run. It's been a ton of fun. No, it hasn't, but it's over, right? 
Um, they go back to the car, they come back and they go, you know, your license is suspended. Right. And I was like, Oh man, I, I didn't know that. I must've missed the letter from the courts. Right. So they go, all right, step out of the car. <clears throat> um, and, uh, put your hands against the car. Just put my hands against the car. And he starts doing cl- the classic pat down, started high shoulders, blah, blah, down the shirt. Yeah. You got any weapons or anything sharp that's going to poke me on you? No officer. I don't. In my mind, I knew I had. 36 bundles of heroin in my po- in my cargo pocket because cargo shorts were still a thing because I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> you know, it was the early 2000s or mid mid 2000s, and he's patting down, patting down, patting down, patting down, and my knees are sh- I'm shaking, vi- actually shaking, <laughs> waiting for the second where his hand finally gets to the cargo pocket because my life is over. And I know that I've already mentally started to accept the fact that I am going to jail for at least 20 years. I've already started to fucking accept that. Okay. And he's patting down, patting down, patting down and gets to the cargo pocket and cargo pockets always had this weird thing where you couldn't really tell if there was something in it or if it was just the cargo pocket. Cause it, and it was those kind of shorts. It wasn't a tight cargo pocket. It had a little bit of bulk there. And for whatever reason, he gets to the fabric and keeps going down my leg. You can go sit on the curb. We're going to search the car. I no, I didn't have anything in the car. Cash, cash. I had cash in the car. I go sit on the curb. I'm literally shaking. Like, I, like, did that really just happen? You're like, is this a prank? <laughs> yeah, this is a prank. And I'm, not, and I'm not out of the situation yet, obviously. Right, 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 right. right. The cops, there's two of them. And they find like, I don't know, maybe like five G's, five or six G's in the um, five grand. Yeah. Right. In the, in the middle compartment. And they come up to me and they go, what, what is this? Why do you have so much cash on you? I'm like, uh, I think my, my answer was awful. I think I said I do odd jobs for my grandmother around the house. What the fuck are you talking about? No, <laughs> no drugs though. Just the cash. So I was right. like, obviously at that point, like if they, if it was a shakedown and they were going to take the cash, I would have been like, take the fucking cash. Right, right, right. Right. Uh, cop comes back up to me, goes nothing in the car. Um, but you can't drive the car, man. You got to You got to call somebody to come pick you up. And I was like, Oh, cause the registration was suspended, right? Like my license. Oh, your license suspended. Yeah. yeah and, and you know, we're giving you a ticket, a summons. Right. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, Nope. No problem. You know right, what I'm right. like, whatever you want. Called my dad. Like this was a situation where you call your dad. Like, cause you need whoever. Like my dad was that one person that I could always call. Dad, I need you to get to this parking lot in East Haven, Connecticut. And he lived in Brantford, which is right next door. In as fa- I don't care if you have to take a spaceship here, dude. I need you here as fast as humanly <laughs> possible, right? He was there in like he was there in like five minutes. I got in his car and left and have, and, and I don't know if I ever recovered from that fear to this right. day, like still yeah, yeah, like, yeah. the scariest moment of my entire life. And so you don't stop there. You would think that, you know, you would say, okay, like, gosh, that was a sign from God, the universe, whatever that maybe, maybe he's like, dude, just stop. I have bigger plans for you. Just change your life. Now go to rehab, go to treatment, whatever it was, but you kept going. You end up, you know, developing a, an addiction to crack. You end up your your grandfather, who is a very important to you in your life and was important in your mom's life, becomes very sick. And there was a moment where you're over, um, you know, his house. I think taking care of him, or your mom's house, taking care of your grandpa. And he was like screaming for help, and you're like getting high upstairs, right? And just that was like a pivotal. I think one of the breaking, one of the last breaking points. I think for you where I think you would just realize that your life was in such shambles that I think you were just paralyzed by fear. You didn't know what to do. You wanted, I think to change, but you just couldn't figure out a way how are you, or the pain hadn't become great enough. I think in those moments where you were forced to make a decision to improve yourself until somebody made that decision for you. And I remember that you end up violating your pro almost violating your probation, I guess, technically you did, but I guess on, uh, technically you didn't because you had this person that gave you this miraculous second chance. So talk about that moment. It was June 18th, 2010. And it was something that completely changed your life. Well, it was actually, I think it was the one person that stopped giving me second chances. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she gave you a second chance in the sense that she could have easily violated you and just sent right. you to, 
And at the time, and at the time, I didn't understand. I actually watched this video on TikTok yesterday, which is my least favorite social media platform because it's just the most childish place. And you know, I, I don't go on much, but watched this video yesterday from this guy who explained the nature of the word maybe. And um, it was this story about, and I'll give you the short version. But one day, uh, this this rancher's uh, horse runs away. And everybody from town comes and they say, oh, my God, like, that's so, so that's terrible that your horse ran away. And he said, uh, maybe. And the next day, the horse came back with seven other horses with it. And they came and they said, oh, that's, uh, that's uh, so fantastic. Like, you, you know, you got seven free horses out of the deal. And he said, maybe. And the next day, his son was trying to ride one of the wild horses. He fell off and he broke his arm. All the people from the town said, that's so terrible that your son broke his arm. We're so sorry. It's terrible. And he said, maybe. And then the next day or a week later or whatever, the, arm, the, the draft started. And because his son had fucked up his arm, he wasn't able to go to war. And that cycle goes on, you know, and, that, and it's very much how life is. And I think that people who go through struggle and trauma – don't understand how good that is going to be for them in the end and right. what that is going to do for their lives. Like it is what built me. It is what made me who I am. I would not trade it for the world. And so did you have that mindset though, when you were in the thick of it or did you, did you know you're going to get out of it? Or were you like, you know, I'm going to die or I'm going to rot in jail. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, and, and I want to get back to, sorry, I, yeah. I was, but, but I will, I'll say this to that. Um, my biggest thing in the book is about this light that yeah. we all have in us, right? And at times in your life, that light is illuminescent and shines like the sun and everything is, is wonderful. And you feel it on you. You feel it in you and on you and around you. And there are other times in this life where that light is so dim, so flickering, and, and hard to find where, where all hope is lost and you couldn't imagine that there's any way out of that scenario. And I would say that for the majority of my addiction, I was in the latter frame of mind. The thing that got me out was that I never let that light go out completely. Mm. And that's the reoccurring theme of this, of the book and of my journey. Don't let your light go out. Do not let that light go out completely. Do whatever it takes to believe in yourself. To, I mean, shit, I, I, I say it figuratively, but I meant it literally for myself. When you can't walk, crawl, drag yourself through the fucking mud because what's on the other side of today or tomorrow or next week is that light coming back brighter than you could ever imagine it. And, and people need to know that. They need to understand that no matter how they feel today or how they feel this week, they're not going to feel like that forever. And things will get better if they keep going. And, and that, was the, that was the most important thing for me. And so I was able to keep that light going, right? E even at its dimmest. When, when uh, my probation officer... So, so what happened with the probation officer was this. I had been through a slew of probation officers and I was on the methadone clinic. And so they, they technically look at the methadone clinic as a medical setting. You're, you're working on yourself. You're doing the best you can. So even if I was popping dirty on urines, they knew that I was under state, or at least they thought that I was under some level of medical care. So they're like, okay, he's already working with doctors. He's already working on this so even though i gave i mean i would say dozens of dirty urines to the probation office in their eyes i was satisfying the requirements of the court which was to work on getting better and to, to solving the problem so i had all these different probation officers and one day my probation officer was was leaving he was getting reassigned to a different office and so they said um you're going to have a new probation officer. Her name's Ellen Ferrari, uh, Milford Probation. Shout out Milford, Connecticut. Uh, and she's going to be your new probation officer. And I was like, a chick? 
this is great. Like, this is, I mean, she's probably gonna be so nice. She's gonna be like a, you know, like a friend to me. She'll probably get, let me off even easier. How can I manipulate this woman now? Cause that's what we do, right? As addicts, we're better than anybody. Right, 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 right. Right. And so I go in there, Ellen, good to meet you. Uh, really happy that you can join me on this leg of my journey. And, you know, as I continue to work to get better, you know, we're like politicians. Meanwhile, I was just waiting to get out of that office so I can go sniff fucking Xanax and <laughs> crap. Do you know what I'm saying? And um, she goes, you know, I mean, she, I think she saw it through it immediately, but she said, uh, good to meet you. Um, you know, ho hopefully um, we, can, we can get you back to a good place in your life. Before we go too far, though, can you just take this cup and just go into the, into the bathroom and just pee in it for me? Absolutely, Alan, no problem. And I went into the bathroom and I peed in the cup and put it into the little thing in the wall and the guy came and got it, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I went back in the office and I was like, oh, all right. You know, I would treat them like my therapist. Like, oh, this week, you know, this happened. And she was like, hey, uh, actually, um, I have another client coming in. So you're gonna, you'll have to leave, but I'll give you a call tomorrow and let you know, you know, what the next steps are. <laughs> and so uh, she called me back the next day and she said, hey, Mike, um, you know, how are you? I, I'm just calling to check in and let you know that your urine came back uh, positive for opiates, benzodiazepines, cocaine, uh, maybe something else. Um, and, uh, and, and I said, no, that's, that's not possible. I, that's not possible. I, I haven't used it in uh, 10 days. There's no way those were in my system. I, I'll come back. I'll pee again. Mike, like, stop. No, you're not going to tell me that I had drunk. Mike, here's how this is going to work. Tomorrow morning, you're either going to go into a detox, followed by a intensive re inpatient rehab facility, or you're going to do your five-year suspended sentence in jail. Now, this is ridiculous. You're not going to tell me I have to make a fucking choice right now. 10.30 a.m. tomorrow, I need to know what you want to do. It hangs up the phone. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? What just happened? Like, is she serious right now? She was dead serious. So the next day I checked into detox. June... 23rd, June 22nd or June 23rd, 2010. And then never use drugs ever again. Wow. Yeah. And so you are a miracle and you're one of the, the few, I think, where you go into treatment, you go into a detox for a few days and then you don't touch it again because that was your first time you had really been stopped completely. Yeah. So what do, what do you think it was like during the early stages that like what kept you in recovery? What kept you clean? Cause I think that's like the hardest thing is like people are now having to learn to cope with stress, cope with anxiety, reattach behavior to emotions or learning how to deal with their demons. Like how did you get through that? For some reason, not not for some reason. It, Were you just scared of going to jail? Like, why did you roll the no, dice? No, my no, I was never scared of anything. Uh, fear, fear has been an absent emotion in my life for a long time. Unless it's fear over dumb, right, doesn't right. make any sense. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like the worry shit. Yeah, but yeah. No, I'm not a fearful guy for the most part. Um, it was not fear that had, that had already left. It was um. I wanted more for myself. Mm. I really did. And, and, and I knew, uh, I knew I, I, I had something, right. I knew I had something to offer and, and we all have something to offer. And, and, and one of the biggest challenges is finding out what that is. Right. But I found a, I, I, right, right off, right off the bat when I got out of rehab. So I was in, so I was in detox for five days. I then went to rehab for another 35. I got kicked out of rehab for fighting but I technically had uh, successfully completed the time there. So they gave me a successful completion, which was good for probation and whatever. 
Um, but when I, when I, when I got out, I felt like, uh, in rehab, I had a lot of time to reflect and I spent a lot of time by myself in this, in this, uh, they call it the meditation room, but I would listen to music. I'd listen to Zeppelin. I would listen to Pink Floyd and a lot of the stuff that I like to listen to at the time. And I journaled and I set up a bucket list for myself. Um, you know, ski Jackson hole, visit California. Like think things like that, you know, that, that I thought would never happen. Right. So, so I spent a lot of time reflecting. I set up this bucket list for myself that, that had all these at the time, seemingly impossible tasks on it. And I, I, I like found a lot of like, um, I found a lot of like serenity and, and, and peace in finally being out of that life. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. After, after like the torture and the, and the battle and the war that that was for so long, there was just something just so um, peaceful about rejoining life at that level. I, I, I don't know. It was, it was a calm that I hadn't felt in so long. But I very quickly, and, and this is, you know, I, I'm a big, I'm a big, guy on um tactics as opposed to just you know open conversation about stuff I, I don't consider myself in any way shape or form whatsoever to be a role model all i all i like to do and because i have a ton of faults still and do a lot of things that i highly uh do not recommend the <laughs> addict or or you know person in recovery to do all i can do is is talk about and offer the things that helped me in a, right. in, a, in a meaningful way. Other than that, like, please do not look at me as some sort of poster child or, or even remotely close of, of successful recovery because I haven't completed any of the fucking steps. Well, maybe a couple of them, but, like, <laughs> you know, I still have multiple addictions to whole things that are not good and, you know, whatever, right? But the things that worked for me are applicable and will work for other people who have a burning desire to be the fully and complete recovered person, Right. One of the first things I fell in love with when I got out of rehab was cycling. And so currently, and, and I have been working on a, a, a foundation called Mike's Bikes. And, and I'm working with a, um, with a, with a foundation that, that helps people create nonprofits called uh, Think Kindness, I believe. Now, now I can't even freaking remember the name all over the place. Uh, but, but, I'd like to start giving bikes to people that are fresh in recovery. And I'll tell mm. you why. So when I first got clean and first got out of rehab, uh, I got this hand-me-down bike. Now, one of, the, one of the other parts of the story that gets overlooked because of all the other stuff is that when I got out of rehab, I was close to 300 pounds, about 100 pounds of pure fat. I mean, wow. I was eating so much fast food, doing so much Xanax. Even though I was smoking crack, it wasn't even hitting. It was nothing. It wasn't doing anything. Like I was eating four meals a day of just straight shit. So when I got a rehab, I think I was like 290 and battered. I mean, teeth, almost all my teeth got like in the back of my mouth gone, uh, just absolutely fucking fried, right? And I needed to get around. I needed to get to meetings because I wanted to do my 90 and 90, which I did. And my mom gave me this hand-me-down giant bicycle. That was the brand. It was a red giant bicycle. And I would ride this thing. And I would ride to meetings. And I would ride around. And, and as, I was, as I was doing tasks on it, I quickly realized, wow, I really like riding this bike. I would, put, I would listen to Mac Miller, which, which, you know, his death, as you read in the book, for me was horrible. And, and, yeah. and, and it was tragically hard for me to, to see him perish from the things that he helped save me from. Mm. Um, and, and I would ride around, I would listen to Mac Miller on the bike and I would, and I would just ride around and it was incredibly freeing and um, being in motion again, moving my legs, getting in shape. Cause you were an athlete as a kid. Correct. And so one of the first things that I found in my early recovery was, okay, there's going to be things like this that make you want to stay clean. They make, they, they and, and by the way, like not to mention the natural dopamine and, and or serotonin dump that exercise gives you. It's, it's, a, it's a feel good activity as much as drugs are. 
And so, and so I started to identify these positive pursuits very early in my recovery. And I, I attribute them to not only keeping me off drugs post uh, getting clean, but not killing myself, to yeah. be honest with you. I mean, I mean, I could not even begin to make people understand the importance of positive coping tactics. Mm. It's everything. It's everything. And, and I, I, would, I would imagine that, you know, you had such low self-esteem at that point because I'm sure once you had the drugs all out of your system, like everything kind of came full circle and all the choices, all the things you saw during your addiction, you're like, wow, there's, I have nothing to run from. It's all here in front of me. How am I going to deal with this? Plus you were you know, close to 300 pounds. So now you're probably, I'm sure, unhappy with the way you looked. You probably just weren't moving well. And you had a bum ankle, right? Because from that, uh, I think you, what, you stepped in a pothole or something and I destroyed your ankle. Yeah, it was a, ro well, it was a robbery. It's a, a tank. Yeah. People tried, to, people tried to rob me. And the ankle is the one thing that continues and is the one thing that continues to cause me trouble. And I'm actually going to have to have fusion on it soon. But um, yeah, I, 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 I um, kind of infamously talked about this on an episode of Impulsive uh, when I did my episode. When I got out of rehab, I had a 400 credit score. My car had been repossessed. I was 100 pounds overweight. I had no friends, no family. You know, my family was there, but I had severed the bond. So of course. At the right. Time. And I was starting at nothing. I was starting at negative. I mean, was so far down. And, 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 for somebody that was early in recovery, that was one of the toughest pills I had to swallow. When mm. I when I came back out and realized what a decade of addiction and and more importantly, a decade of non-development and personal growth looks like on the back end. And and it was one of the it was one of the tougher pills I had to swallow as I looked around me and you know the kids I graduated high school with were married and had mortgages and 401ks and um all these things that i you know saw as the signals of success in life and it it was a very painful blow to me to realize how how out of reach that all seemed um and and i i guess like i just started to identify these these positive movements right and and it's it's almost like almost liken it to being a baby again you know yeah. in, in a lot of ways and and you 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 realize how far behind you are but what you really need to realize is is how far how much space you can cover in a hurry if you stay clean yeah. And, and, and I mean, I mean, damn, dude, it, it was it was not that long before I was sitting in, in, in board meetings with with millionaires. You know, I mean, not that long. It, it was. You make if you stay clean and you make a few positive moves in your life, you can escape that early recovery dread a lot faster than you think you can. Yeah. And I think for you, you get out, you start cycling riding a bike, you drop some weight, you start to get into shape, that builds confidence in itself. Now you're feeling better, not only because you're not using drugs, but you're feeling better because of the endorphin rush, the way you look, you're like, wow, I'm actually taking care of myself. You're feeling like the quote unquote old you a little bit. And then you start getting these, these little jobs, right? I think you were, you were a dog walker. You were like a dog daycare counselor where you had like 30 dogs. Yeah. <laughs> you were a journalist. You were a wedding photographer. You were doing all these things. And then all of a sudden, another turning point for you was you see this ad on Craigslist for now, this big company that we all know, I was actually looking at buying one of these a few years ago, um, Love Sack, and you end up applying for this job, which I think in that, in that moment, you had no quote unquote real credibility as far as getting that. But what, walk the audience through like what happened there, how you got that job, because it's, it's a pivotal point. And I think it also just shows how you just got to put yourself out there. And then once, and it's like, it's sometimes it's personality over credentials. Like you can have all the credentials in the world, but if you're not relatable, if you don't put your, if you're not a hard worker, if you don't care, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I was selling it, man. I was selling <laughs> it so hard. I was, I was a classic fake until you make it story. And listen, like 
us addicts, dude, man, we all got something. If you, I, 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 and th like, this is the biggest thing I ever said. If you're out there right now and you're listening to this podcast and you have survived addiction and you have survived mental illness and you have been through the fucking ringer and you have woken up today and you're still going, you have something. You have something, dude. You may not know exactly what it is, but you have something. There's something there. And, and, and that is one of the most, that was one of the most important things that I really realized when I started to see people react to me and, and, and absorb me when I started to get in better shape and started to act better and stuff like that. We all have something. We are warriors. We're soldiers. And we, and we, and you need to embrace that. Right. And so the, the issue is just simply finding out what that is. Right. And so what I, the advice I give the audience and the people when I speak on, you know, at these speaking things or anything like that is start trying stuff. If you can, if you can simply find something that you enjoy doing, find a way to get semi good at it. I assure you there's a way to monetize that activity. Okay. And so when I, so I was, I was riding my bike all the time. I'd started to get into shape and I, I <laughs> wanted to start taking photos because I was like, I, I had already started taking photos with my phone. You know, I got in a phone and started that addiction, obviously, which is a whole new addiction that everybody has to deal with. Right. And I started taking pictures of food and random stuff. I'm like, and people would say, yo, you're you actually take decent photos. Like, you know, and I, I started like this, like little, you know, food thing, whatever. And I was like, maybe I could take this more seriously. So I, so I, uh, I, I don't remember how I was getting the money at the time. I was doing, Oh, I was, I was taking care of my grandfather. I was taking care of my grandfather. Uh, this, so I was after I got clean, but before he passed. And um, I saved up enough money. This was working with the dogs, right? And I'd gotten that job with my, my sister had gotten me that job, blah, blah, and that whole story. But I, I, I saved up enough money to buy a camera because I like taking pictures. And so you know, I, was, I would go down to the duck pond and I would take pictures of stuff. I would take random pictures. And one day I was taking pictures and um, someone came up to me or like messaged me on Facebook about the pictures or something and said, hey, I have a, a wedding coming up. Do you do wedding photography? And I said, absolutely, I do wedding photography. I'm, I, you know, one of the, one of the better uh, wedding photographers. I'd never even been to a wedding. I had never been to a wedding before. Of course I do wedding photography. Oh, what's your rate? Uh, what's your budget? And she told me her budget and I said, perfect, I'll be there. And I showed up with an Oxford button down on and, and took the photos. And they were not that great, but for her budget, they were acceptable. And so I took that money and a little bit more cash. And I was like, what can I, what else do I like doing? Because I really like taking pictures. And I said, I started seeing these drones fly around. Everywhere I'd go, I'd see this DJI Phantom 1 drone. And kids were playing with them and taking pictures of soccer games and shit. And so I saved up the, the two G's or whatever it was to get this DJI Phantom drone. And one day I was flying the drone back. I think I was at the beach now in Milford. And a woman came up to me and goes, that, that thing's crazy. I have, this is going to sound strange, but I have a wedding coming up. Would you be able to fly that thing at the wedding and take video with it? And I said, it's funny you say that. I'm one of the biggest... Uh, <laughs> aerial wedding cinematographers in the state of Connecticut. And she said, well, how much does it cost? I said, well, what's your budget? 2,500 bucks later, I'm at the wedding fly. I was one of the, probably one of the first people to fly a drone over a wedding. So followed the bride and groom down the aisle. It was, the footage was awful, but it was good enough for the budget, right? What I'm getting at here is find what you like doing and, and it, it, people will gravitate to it if you create any kind of decent product. And so before you knew it, I had this photography and videography uh, uh, um, skill set starting to be applied. I had this writing. I, I was doing writing for AOL and taking pictures for, for AOL because they had seen my photography online. And then one day, as you said, I saw this, this ad in Craigslist you know, uh, replied via email. And then he called Sean Nelson, CEO of Love Sack, uh, one of my biggest mentors in life. Uh, and one of the guys that really, you know, catapulted me and put me into the, into the, onto the scene 
called me and said, you know, like, hey, I'm looking for a guy to help me run my social media and handle PR. And of course, here's me. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> one of my main skill sets is, you know, PR for big brands. And, you know, I'm on Google looking up like, what is aware brand awareness? What does that mean? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm a huge driver of brand awareness and know all about that stuff. And uh, it was enough to get a sit down with him. And um, I was onboarded to be his personal social and PR guy, uh, you know, a couple weeks later. And then about a year after that, I was brought on full time at the brand uh, because of the work that I was able to do and was responsible for driving pretty much the entire uh, Love Sack social media and influencer engine prior to a $200 million um, IPO on, on NASDAQ. And uh, the rest is kind of history. Met, met Logan Paul through that Love Sack job uh, for a marketing gig. We quickly became really good friends and I was able to you know, prove value to him really quickly. And we started, you know, one of the biggest podcasts in the world. And that's the set I'm talking to you from. So it's, it's a weird, uh, it's a weird story, man. It's a very strange story and a very interesting story, but it's also a story that can be replicated by someone listening to this. And that's the most important part. Well, it's interesting because I think as you t tell your story and it unfolds, I think you're being set up for what you're doing now. I mean, you think about selling drugs, like whether you like it or not, to be a good drug dealer, you got to be able to build rapport. You got to be reliable. You got to be, I guess, somewhat honest, right? You got to be able to, because otherwise, if you're dishonest or if you lie, you don't show up, like people aren't going to come back to you. So you have to build community, right? You got to get people to like you. You got to kind of do whatever it takes to get things done. So you have that. You have the entrepreneurial spirit. You get out of rehab, you get on the bike, you lose some weight, you get some confidence and you're like, oh, well, what can I start now? I'm going to start taking photos, do this, do that. And then you get people to like, you build rapport and then you take the photos and the video, all that's like needed for love sack. You build rapport there. And then Logan texts you, you guys have a real exchange and won't repeat for the sake of the audience, won't repeat the, the exact words, but it was something like he had texted you about. Can we, just say it? we can say, it. I mean, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So love sack is, is infamous for their washable covers. And um, you know, it's one of the, the major tenants of, of the Love Sack brand. And uh, through, the, through an agency or something, me and Logan got connected and I got a text message one day that was, hey, uh, this is Logan Paul. And the agency had told me that he was going to text me. And I didn't give a fuck. I, they, they, that term influencer was just becoming big and I, I didn't care one bit. Didn't give a shit about who he was, nothing. But I knew it was important to the job, obviously. And he, uh, he texted me and he was like, Hey man, um, this is Logan Paul. I said, awesome, man. Good to meet you. And he said, um, now, did you know who he was at the time? I mean, at the, at the time he was, he was like a vine star. He was just starting his YouTube. So he was still, he was still, he was massive already massive, but I had no idea who he was. I didn't know anything about that space. I didn't know anything about vine or anything. Like I had an Instagram of course, but like, I didn't get it. I was like, right. what, is the, what is this shit? Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but I knew he was important because the agency said so, and they were a big agency at the time. Still are. And uh, so I, so I get the text message and um, hey, it's, hey, it's Logan. And I was like, awesome. Good to meet you. And he said, Hey, uh, these, these covers are uh, machine washable. It says, he was like, do you think that I could have sex on? Them? And it was, it was this weird moment where he was testing me. He wanted to see if I was just like a, uh, like, is this a marketing guy that's going to try to use me? Is this a marketing guy that's going to try to get me to do a bunch of shit for his brand? It's contractual, or is this somebody that I can have an open conversation with? And he said, uh, do you think I can have sex on him? And I said, well, actually, the good thing about uh, love sex is it comes in machine washable, so the cum would wash right out of them. You just throw it in the washing machine. And he wrote, <laughs> ha, 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 like a million times, right? And, it from, and then his whole demeanor post-making that joke changed completely and immediately the first texts after that were much more fluid and open and relaxed. Right. And so I guess, and now, and the rest is history. I mean, me and him, you know, started hanging out and have created, you know, immense amounts of, of uh, some of the most consumed content on the planet and, you know, interviewed Mike Tyson and six, nine and uh, Russell Brand and everybody under the sun and have been all over the world together. And obviously the boxing now and everything. And, um, uh, I think the takeaway there for the audience is like, you know, find whatever it is that helps you build rapport. And I don't know what that is that helps you uh, relationship build. For me, it's two things. My smile, which never goes away, and my ability to make people laugh. Those yeah. are my two things. I'm, I'm, very, I'm a super easygoing person. And the first thing I'm going to do when I meet you is make you feel warm, welcome, and probably laugh. 
And I, I, I'm quite literally an expert at it. I don't always know how to explain it to people, but, but my ability to work a room is my big, is my greatest gift. Right. And so like, if you're listening to this and you're trying to find out what your, your thing is in terms of being able to network and build relationships, you just have to figure out what that is. I mean, some people are really good at explaining their value very mm. simply and quickly. Some people are able to, some people do magic tricks. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like there's a thing for everyone and you need to figure out what that is for people like, for people like me, luckily, and I was blessed with this. Um, there's this like, uh, I do, I do these things because I'm very California now. And I like before the show, I had an acai bowl, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like I'm, I, I live here now. And even though I'm from the East coast with, with you guys out there, I'm, I've been Californianized. Um, and they do these things out here called like gene keys where they like, I don't know why I'm giving it a Southern accent, but <laughs> it's, it's called like gene keys where they try to like discover like who you are and like what, like what your, your, um, what your aura is like kind of like how to best describe it and the yeah. rarest one is called the charisma gene and that's the one that i have which is like this this like unstoppable ability to make people feel welcome and and relaxed and comfortable and build that rapport very quickly and so i i was blessed with that um and it's so palpable you know for me and 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 it and it's such a it's honestly, if you have that, it's like one of the most like monetizable skill sets and like, and like genes that you can potentially have in life because you're able to just befriend anyone at any time, you know? Yeah. I feel like you <laughs> always had this sense of, of, of love, like level of loving and, and care for other people, even through your addiction, there was different moments in the book where you displayed, you had still had some sense of moral compass that you really, you pushed it to the edge, but there was times where you could have pushed it a little further and yep. you didn't, I think your moral compass kept you there and i remember you describing like one of the toughest things for you like many of us is what the relationship with your mom and i got goosebumps when you were tell the story of when you were pretty much asked to leave and the tears just coming down her face and i just could tell for you that that was hard on you and i know that's been instrumental in your recovery and, and your redemption story is is your mom because i think no matter what there was a lot of people in your in your family in your life that kind of just just stood by you to some extent um just through the years and and i think it's really admirable what you've created because then you start you start working with logan and then you know you help him build his brand and you're you've been instrumental in impulsive right you guys started that show together yeah. So, I mean, listen, like Logan, when I, when I joined Logan, he was already a, a global superstar. What, you know, it took a, we hung out for a couple of years and I was with him from his original rise on YouTube. Uh, I was talking to him and, and, and friends with him, but I joined the team after, after a very pivotal moment, pivotal moment in his life, which was the largest internet, you know, faux pas of all time, which was the Tokyo situation. Right. Um, joined, officially joined him from a from a, a, um, a team standpoint from a financial and, and partnership standpoint uh, after that happened and he was at a, a extremely extremely low point in his life where um, he just didn't know what he was gonna do he didn't know what he was gonna I mean I mean it, it was this was one of the most full-on shutdowns of a, of a celebrity in the history of, of culture right mm. um, and and um, I was able to, to, to join him and, and, and what it, what it led to was, it, I think pretty much the majority of the audience understands it, but there's a lot of people who don't, and there's a lot of people on the internet that don't understand a lot of shit. I mean, as, right. as you know, I mean, it's, it's a very, just, you got to assume that a lot of people are not as in the know and, 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 uh, up to speed on these intricate delicate relationships as we are um and and it, what 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 came out of us joining each other was one of the most symbiotic relationships that i know of i mean i i, I came in and acted as a mentor to him acted as a person to keep him from doing any other fucked up things you know and and by the way um was able to to teach him about empathy and about a lot of the things that i had learned through my struggles and was able to actually help him absorb the, the shit that I've been through. And then also the, the good stuff too, the corporate stuff, the stuff I learned at Lovesack. 
And in exchange, he was able to, he, he platformed me in exchange, you know, in, in exchange, he taught me about making content. He taught me about, um, he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot about a lot of things and even, even life stuff. He's a vet. Logan Paul is a very, very smart, uh, uh, all, all, to be honest, like as much as people hate, you know, some people hate hearing it almost genius level person. I mean, he was an, he was an AP, you know, physics kid and, He's very, very, very intelligent and understands extremely well what an audience wants to hear and, 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 and see, right? And so our relationship started in, in, in uh, you know, in, in me trying to help him avoid further conflict and to regrow and rebuild his brand, but has blossomed into a, a partnership where we yeah. built Impulsive together. We started Impulsive in... Uh, I believe November of 2018. I could be wrong about that. Um, might've been a little bit after that. Um, and now we've done, you know, 280 episodes, 290 episodes of, uh, you know, one of the most loved uh, podcasts on, on the internet, you know, and we've had absolutely incredible guests, uh, you know, <laughs> and not so incredible. I mean, we've had, you know, people that, that, cause argument we've had Alex Jones on Ben Shapiro. Uh, I mean, I, we've had so many guests on the show and, 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 and movers and shakers of all, you know, types and sizes. Um, and, and the journey with Logan has been incredible. And, and honestly the, today, just us having this, this conversation right now, um, we, we're in a, a transitional period right now for the both of us. And, um, he is, um, moving down to Puerto Rico and uh, for for various reasons that we don't have to get too far into, right? right. But, um, but uh, he is um, going to continue building out Logan Paul into one of the biggest entertainers, boxers, uh, people in the world. And uh, I had to make a decision over the past couple of months whether or not I wanted to continue – uh, riding on a rocket ship that had a sole purpose of building out an individual. That wasn't me. Um, and uh, someone that like myself, who's come from a team setting their whole life and has worked towards common goals in both businesses and other uh, pursuits of my life and um, an entrepreneur in his own right, it was, it's, it's been a really tough decision to have to make to, um, to move on from, the living arrangement and the, cause I've, you know, I've lived with him for the past three years, we've lived together, you know? And so um, we're kind of in this transitional period. He just went down to Puerto Rico yesterday and will now be staying there. And I've already got a new house with a new team. Um, the podcast will continue obviously, uh, but we'll be remote. Um, and so it's, uh, you, you caught me on a, on a very uh, bittersweet and, um, just odd day for that for our relationship but 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 another takeaway the one thing i've ever found out about life is that um anytime you shake the cards anytime you shake the the the, the field or, or your field of view anytime you shake things up and destroy what is rebuilt what comes after that is always either better or a lesson that leads to something better. Yeah. Anytime in your life where you're able to really shake things up and start with a new, something new, that, that change leads to greatness. And so I'm, I'm as, as much as I, I am saddened by, you know, not, not being the kid's right hand man anymore and, and, and being with him constantly. Um, I'm excited for the future. Yeah. And I appreciate you, sh you sharing that. And it's just, it's definitely, I'm sure bittersweet, you know, especially after the fight Saturday night with with Jake winning and then Floyd Mayweather. I think I saw him post today on his Instagram that they're trying to nail down a, a date or a location for, for him and Logan to fight, to box. Yeah. But, you know, I think in times like this, what tends to happen, and um, I'm sure you would agree with this, is sometimes we we hit a, a, low, a little bit of a low point because we're like, man, like, am I going to be able to reinvent myself again? Or am I going to be able to move on? Am I going to be able to, to become something? Is there going to be competition? Like, what's it going to be like? But then you look back and you're like, look at how far I've come. And look at all the skills that have that I have learned along the way throughout my entire life that have got me to be able to do this. 
And I'm sure the same thing's going to happen in like two months from now, two years from now, when you build your own brand, so to speak, you know, build off of night shift and continue with impulsive and whatever else you're going to do. And you're like, wow, because of my time working with Logan and everything that I learned along the way, I wouldn't have been able to do what I'm doing now without that. Yeah. And I think when people can find those silver linings, I think that that's how they'll be able to have peace. Because I think in the moment, it's it's hard because I'm sure right now it's hard. You're like, as much as I'm sure right now you don't want to get emotional, I'm sure it's an emotional time because you look at as much as you helped Logan through the time where he was struggling, I'm sure you're like, man, this guy gave me a chance. And this yeah. guy elevated me to who I am now with YouTube and TikTok and Instagram and lifestyle, the rich and the famous and going to parties and doing all these things that you're like, man, like 10 years ago, I was just trying to survive and <laughs> not, not end up back in jail. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, he, no, a hundred percent. he'll, I'll look at him similarly to how I look at Sean um, from Love Sack. I mean, I, um, I, yeah, without him, none of it would have been possible. I mean, I mean, luckily, um, I can confidently say now that I can stand on my own feet. Yeah, uh, for sure. I, I, I obviously have, cause, cause, cause the thing is, is aside from, <laughs> aside from seeing him once or twice a day in between his calls, my calls, crypto meeting, whatever workouts, the one thing we've ever done together has really over the past year and a half plus, as we have both gotten so busy with our own pursuits has been the podcast. And so as long as we're still doing that, technically, wherever I live, things haven't changed all that much. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? We just never – we really haven't been hanging out all that much. He's so busy. And, you know, sometimes he's got a girlfriend. I've got whatever a girlfriend. And, um, you know, I think it's a proximity thing. But but we'll, we'll, we'll continue to see each other and continue to work with you. We're just too close of friends to, yeah. to, have, to have it fall apart. Yeah. I mean, I am sure you will. And I'm sure you guys will continue to build – what you guys have together and then do your own thing and build off of that. So one of the last questions I want to ask you is I know like in recovery, especially probably now, even like right now with what you're doing, what you're going through, like we all have demons, right? We all have things that we're dealing with either currently or from our past or whatever. Like, like what are some of the healthy coping mechanisms that you implement when you're stressed, when you're anxious, because I know you, you said you pretty much wake up and you're like shaking with anxiety. So how do you, how do you deal with it in a way that's, that's not destructive? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have gone through various, um, various stages of, of mental illness, you know, since I was a child and they've manifested themselves in ways that have been, um, at times extremely bad, you know, yeah. and, and, um, as, you know, you read the book, so you know about the, the moment in Nantucket with my sister where I was really unsure about if I wanted to continue going on or not. And this is even post-addiction post, uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So yep. in, my, in my recovery. Um, and I still struggle quite a bit. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's generally affected by um, fa- other factors in life. And, and, you know, like I had a really bad run this past month with COVID. I lost a very good friend of mine uh, to a motorcycle accident. The kid that actually... Uh, was my first friend out of rehab, uh, Mike Crock. He, he was the kid that I rode bikes with. He was the kid that introduced me to my first girlfriend and um, horribly uh, tragic motorcycle accident uh, about a month ago, maybe less, that uh, we lost Mike. And <clears throat> that was just a really, that was a really tough time for me between that and COVID and, um, and, 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 a, and a number of other things that happened all at the same time. And, and you know how it is with life when it rains yeah. it and everything kind of happens at the same time um and uh you know it's everything is about how you deal with that shit everything about how you cope with that stuff and so for me one of the one of the best things you can do is is a lot of people get worried about how to about how they're infusing good and not worried enough about getting rid of the bad For and sure. so obviously drugs is the easiest one that's the first place our brain goes but there's a lot of other unhealthy behaviors for me you know i've always noticed a spike in my anxiety after i have unprotected sex like like random little things that in everyone's life you'll notice spike your mental illness and that and so it could be being lethargic for some people it could be this for some people right but what you need to do is you need to start to mentally understand your program right and what are the and set boundaries and really fucking stick to those boundaries. Right. And so like 
what are the things that are causing mass amounts of anxiety or, or depression or whatever in your life? A big one for me is lack of sleep. If I don't get the necessary seven hours or whatever it is of sleep, I find myself at a heightened anxiety level, right? Yeah. When I when I um when I don't exercise, if I don't get a thirty minute cardio session in or forty five whatever it is, right? I find a heightened sense of anxiety. If I eat really shitty, if I find myself eating, you know, McDonald's or something like that late at night. And so what you do is you, you try to find those boundaries and then flip them and say, okay, how can I structure and discipline myself around, around those activities? Mm. And so, every, and so what's my workout look like today? Because I know that when I don't work out, this happens. So what does it look like? What am I doing? What's my plan? When am I working out? What can I eat? That's extremely healthy. That's going to make me, my, me and my body, my mind feel good. Like I said, I had that acai bowl today. I could have had a burrito. I could have had a burrito this morning. Like there's, you know, like everybody else was eating burritos. We're not everybody else. Mental illness sufferers and drug addicts and people in recovery aren't everybody else. We have to take certain precautions and be a little bit more cautious about what we put in our bodies. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's finding out what makes you feel good and, and, and getting away from what makes you feel bad. And that would be, you know, I think, I think, Anybody listening to this right now can go and do a, a very quick five minute inventory and either in their notes app on their phone or writing it down on paper, think about what makes you feel good and what makes you feel bad and just be aware of those things. I love how tactical you are. You know, you put it so simply and, and I, I think that's a great quality of yours is how, how tactical you are with you know, things that work for you, things that, you know, don't work for you, things that'll make you feel like crap, things that'll make you feel better. You know, I'm a, tra I've been a trainer for, for over 10 years. So I, I totally understand obviously the importance of exercise, nutrition, proper sleep, that sort of thing. Um, but I think you, you've kind of hit it. You're like, okay, like you have to have hyper, you have to be hyper aware, know what works for you, know what doesn't know what makes you feel good, know what makes you feel bad and then work off of that. And so the last question I have for you is this is, is there's a lot of parents that, that listen to this and I would say that there's probably parents maybe listening to this. Or they have someone they know there that someone's struggling with addiction. And so I don't want you to maybe give advice, but maybe from your experience, like, and you were in the thick of your addiction, what, what would you have wanted from your, your mom? What would you have wanted from your dad, your sisters in that moment to, um, to kind of help you like, take that first step to, to get well and to make something of yourself. Like you said, you want it, man. I, it's such a, it's, it, there is such a balance between. I can't even begin to relate or understand what it must be like for these parents. Yeah. I, I, I honestly, th th this is the topic that really, really, hurts me and upsets me because my mom is it, it, that, that is such a uh painful but also amazing topic for me and it, and, it, and it i can't even begin to imagine what it's like to be the loved one of an addict I'll ne that's the one thing i'll never be able to relate to or understand in life um that pain and 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 they want to walk this thin line between just smothering these people with love and, 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 and compassion and care and showing them that, 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 that tough love. And honestly, maybe I'm biased because of what ended up working for me. But lately, like, I, I guess like I've been leaning a little bit more towards that route of just not enabling yeah. that behavior. And, and this is such a tricky topic. It's such a trip, tricky topic, but like, I just feel like that desperation, like, like the fire touching the ass of the young addict, like, like that first night on the streets with nowhere to live, that, I feel like that might be enough for some. And if it's not enough, it's at least a start. Like that coddling mentality, I think I had a lot of that through my mom and my grandmother, and I think it really allowed me to keep going. And I know it's so hard to have to to have to tell your kid like I'm fucking done with you because you because you are you are 
ruining your life and you're and you're ruining our lives too and i cannot take this anymore right and and, and so I, I what what you're at what you're asking me to give advice on right now well it's just like if you were in that I, moment I, yeah i i hear you what, but what you're asking me to give advice on right now i liken to string theory yeah. do you, you know what i'm saying or, or rocket yeah. science like i i can look back at my life and the choices I made and, and, and what addiction was like for me and how painful that was for me. But it is so hard. It is so hard to be a family member, to be a loved one of a, of an addict. And honestly, like I, 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 there is a, there is a, I put my, my soul. I've not put my soul into many things in this life. I put my soul into this book. It is, it is, it is my, my shining achievement in life. The entire book was edited and proofread by some of the best, you know, people in the, in the, in the space and, and some stuff was moved around and I wrote it all, but it, we you needed editing and proofreading. The final chapter of the book is a book called Afterthoughts. It was untouched. I said, no one will touch this chapter of the book. I do not want it proofread. I do not want it edited. I do not want a single change made to this chapter of the book. The last three pages of that chapter, the last three pages of the book, is the most impactful writing content I will ever produce. And what that is, is letters to the people who are suffering. And everyone I talk to talks about these last three pages. There's a letter to the person who has never suffered through mental illness or addiction. There's a letter to the family members and there's a letter to the person suffering. And I cried my eyes out for all three of those letters. The entire time I wrote it without exception. And, and all I can offer to the family member or to the person suffering is what I put in those pages, honestly. And this is not a promo. I, I please, by all means, take in this episode. And if you decide that this, I, I have not promoted or told anyone this book is a must read. Luckily, I've had 50,000 buyers been able to say, this is a must read. You have to read this book, right? But, but that is all I can offer. It is just such a tough answer. And, and at the end of the day, I guess, I guess, what I would leave with is this. If you're a parent, if you're a loved one, if you're a spouse, it is not a shared battle. This is not your battle. This is not your fault. This is not your mess to clean up. This is not a burden for you to carry. This is a personal journey that the addict must go through and decide on their own accord when they are finished when they have had enough pain and when they are ready to change their lives whatever you do couldn't have been be done better whatever you've done couldn't have been done better so what advice do i have to someone who has either lost someone or continues to battle with someone every day keep going keep going Keep doing whatever it is you're doing that is keeping that addict alive because that is the best you could possibly do. That's it. That's all I have. I can't, there's nothing else I could say. There's no other piece of advice I could give because of how challenging that scenario is besides keep going and don't let the fucking light go out. Mm, love it. And that's been your motto your whole life is just keep going. You will get through this. You will get through this. Keep going. Keep going. And I love it, man. I think you're right. I think there's people listening to this. They have a loved one who's struggling that only thing they can do is to keep going, do what they need to do to, to help the addict in a way that you said, like you said, is not enabling. It's not, it's helpful. And I would say too, is to take care of themselves because we see a lot of people, they become codependent and they lose themselves in hopes of just giving all their energy to their loved ones. So I can't em emphasize enough to take care of yourself, join a community, make sure you're exercising, taking care of your mental health, sleeping well, all that sort of thing. Um, so Mike, this has been awesome. This has been one of the most like real and raw conversations I've had on here. Um, and I appreciate it a lot, man. And I think a lot of people are going to get a ton of value out of it. Hopefully we were able to go down some different paths, um, that maybe you haven't shared before that was just traditionally different than 
just than just sharing your story. So I know people are going to want to follow you. They're going to want to listen to the podcast, watch the podcast, check you out on YouTube, Instagram, and get your book. So where can people do that? Uh, Instagram, Hey Big Mike. Uh, YouTube is The Night Shift, Mike Malak. If you just search that channel, pop up. Impulsive is the podcast. That's kind of our favorite place to be. Um, and then the book, I mean, if you listen to this podcast and you found um, it to be, you know, specific to your, to your life, then the book is called The Fifth Vital. It's on uh, Amazon in paperback, and it's also on Audible. Uh, I do the audio book, so if for some reason you're an enjoyer of my voice, uh, it is uh, one of the top 10, top 10 ranked audio books on Audible. Um, five stars across the board on both the book and the audio book. So hopefully you enjoyed as much as, uh, as, much as uh, you did the show. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Yes. Mike Malak, this has been an absolute pleasure. I encourage you all to go follow him, check him out, get his book, and be sure to take a screenshot, tag him, tag myself with a takeaway, maybe something you learned. Maybe it was something he shared that maybe made you laugh about his story or just a tip he provided. We once again thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. 